Great. Good morning, St. John's. Welcome. Uh, hopefully you saw Sari's Rector's Corner video um, from this past Crossroads talking about this new Conversations at the Crossroads series that we're um, excited about as, as a way to really delve into these real, real issues um, at, at the crossroads of our faith and life that, as we like to say, um, in conversation with one another. And so this first series is on scripture and race, using scripture as a lens and a framework to, um, to, to help us have those conversations as people of faith, um, asking, asking what scripture has to say to us as, uh, in, as modern people in our modern time um, in terms of uh, race and racism specifically. So this morning we are gonna start with a familiar passage from Mark. And I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the screen so we can read it together. Mark 7, verses 24 to 30. Jesus got up, left that place, and went to the region of Tyre. When he took up residence in a house, he didn't want anyone to know, but it wasn't possible for him to remain hidden. On the contrary, news of him at once reached a woman who had a young daughter with an unclean spirit. She came and threw herself down at his feet. She was Greek, a Syrophoenician by race, and she asked him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Let the children eat what they want first, Jesus replied. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Well, master, she said, even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs that the children drop. Well said, replied Jesus. Off you go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed, the demon gone. My first reaction whenever I read this story is like, wait, did Jesus really just call that woman a dog? Is this the savior that we follow and recognize, right? What do we do with that? We want there to be, I want there to be, right, some other explanation. And this is not the only way that we can interpret this passage, right? Sometimes we hear it framed like, well, actually that word is more of a term of endearment, um, that the translation is should be closer to something like little puppies. Um, but that doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the passage, right? Because Jesus is clearly drawing a line of, of separation, not to mention this hierarchy where children are above dogs, right? Um, and, you know, I think you've heard me say this before, probably, that in passages as, as uh, short and pithy as this one, we want to pay attention to every detail, right? Every, every word is there for a reason. And we see in this passage that, G, that the woman's racial difference from Jesus is mentioned, right? It's highlighted. Um, and then we also, we might hear a different, different translation that says, well, this is Jesus' um, sort of pedagogical method, right? He is deliberately testing this woman um, to see how strong her faith is. And we certainly do have examples of, of Jesus' teaching in that way. But these takes are, in my opinion, at the at the end of the day, somewhat of um, of like interpretive gymnastics, right? We want, of course, to let Jesus off the hook. We want to calm our own discomfort, um, and those are reasonable things to want to do. But I also think they they can prevent us from really grappling with the text as we get it, um, and uh, by my read, also deprive us of of the real full spectrum of Jesus' humanity, right? A Jesus who, a savior who shows us how to be ever more human and ever more humane in his willingness to grow and evolve and to learn and to be taught. Um, so I'll just say this take might feel a little uncomfortable and that's okay. You might have questions or reservations about it. This might not be your favorite way to read it and that's okay too. Um, but I want to ask for the purposes of this conversation that you come along with me um, and that we explore, you know, what this what this framing um, has to say to us as we try to grapple as modern people with with this question of race and racism. 
right? So by my lights, by this reading, right, we see a Jesus who's influenceable, right? And influenced by his, the people that he counter, encounters, his interactions with their humanity. Um, and so it gives us this real gift of, you know, the, the fully human God is also a template, right? Um, in our own quest to be ever more fully human, uh, we're not expected to be perfect. We're not expected to get everything right the first time, but we do need to be influenceable, right? And to be truly connected to other people in such a way that we can be moved by their humanity. Um, I also see a sort of uh, disconnect between ideals and practice happening in this text, right? We all operate, or we like to operate on this level of ideals. We might say things like, I don't see race, or I believe that everybody is equal and made in the image of God, or even all are welcome, right? And those are ideals. And sometimes we live up to them and sometimes we don't. Um, but I think we can take this story as permission, right? To sort of see ourselves clearly um, and, and to grow and evolve and hopefully to sort of close the gap between um, our, our ideals and, and what happens in practice, right? So to take a closer look at the story, Jesus has just come from the Pharisees, right? He's been lecturing them about rules and righteousness. Uh, and in the story preceding this one in the Gospel of Mark, he's been insisting to the Pharisees that it's not adherence to these Jewish laws and norms that make a person worthy, but rather the contents of their heart. And so then the very next thing that happens in Mark is it was, we get this story of, the, of this Syrophoenician woman, right? You have this encounter um, where Jesus is, has, uh, is confronted in, in the flesh, face to face with his ideals right? There she is. Um, and so he's been preaching this and teaching this. And now the question is, does he see what she's presenting in terms of like an opera? Hey, Sarah, we lost the last. Yeah. We lost. Uh, can you just go back like yeah. about 10 seconds? Okay. Yeah. Um, right. So, so we have Jesus um, first, you know, with the Pharisees talking about um, um, it not being so much about adherence to Jewish laws and norms that that make a person worthy, but rather the contents of the heart. Right. And then the very next story is this this very human confrontation with this woman who is outside of his um, his own self-understanding of his ministry, right? Out, outside of his group. Um, and so we have the confrontation between the ideals that he's just stated to the Pharisees and this woman in the flesh who, who uh, says, you know, I see that you have something that I need. I hear you saying something that can apply to me. Um, and so she brings him face to face with his own teaching, right? So he has this opportunity here to see past her otherness, you know, past this sort of barrier to her humanity, to her need, right? The question is, can he be enlarged by this encounter? Um, and it's such an uncomfortably human moment where Jesus essentially says, but you're not here who I'm here for, right? I'm here to hold the Israelite people to their own ideals, right? I'm here to bring spiritual sustenance and, and grace and God's healing to this group, right? He understands himself as the Jew, right? Called from and to the Jewish tradition. Fair enough, right? This woman sort of falls outside of his agenda and his his frame of reference. Um, and, and Mark here refers to her as a Greek, which is sometimes shorthand for pagan, right? So you've got the sort of religious difference there, right? And it's also, this is another uncomfortable thing, it was not an uncommon racial slur for Jews to call Gentiles dogs, right? So you've got this real insider-outsider stuff happening. And then the other remarkable thing, I think, is that this woman, this racially other woman, insists on being seen, right? Jesus has plans for peace and quiet. The text says he, he took up residence at this house wishing to go unnoticed. Um, but she's got this real need, and she's heard what he's about, and she believes what he stands for. So she asks, and she asks again, 
right? For him to for him to make good on what he's saying about who God is and what God wants. Um, and she manages to do it, right? She manages to convince him. And Jesus does come around. He does see her humanity and her need right in front of him. Um, and, and, and sees that this division, right, this line of demarcation that he understands himself to be operating within actually works against his mission, right? It works against his understanding of, of God's new way of being in the world with us. So by my reading, this, is, uh, this passage is a story of Jesus, in a sense, Jesus' own conversion to this larger, more inclusive understanding of the kingdom of God, right? To this understanding that there's no one outside of God's family. So I think we can say we see that J Jesus bridges the gap here, right? Between his stated ideals and the way that he is in the world. He's changed by this encounter, um, right? There's, there's this growth from like a, just a cognitive understanding of, of what he's preaching and, and this idea that worthiness is not dependent on a particular racial and religious identity that is expressed in a certain way to a lived understanding that um, that those those lines of delineation don't exist within God's family, right? That it's it's the humanity of each person that and not some smaller category that's connective and important. James Baldwin wrote that that God should make us is meant to make us larger, freer, and more loving. Right? And in my reading of this, which is actually one of my favorite passages, I think we see Jesus becoming larger freer and more loving th through this human encounter, right? Um, and I, the reason it's one of my favorites is because it's so hopeful, right? And it's got this inspiring, like, uh, implication for our own humanity, right? That we are, uh, we have not only the, the permission, but also the invitation and the expectation that we um, are changed by our encounter with otherness. Right? That we don't have to be perfect, but that we do need to be influenceable, right? That connection is really across all of these boundaries that we that we make for ourselves, that connection is really the important part. Um, and so at this point, I want to offer offer this to our our discussion to sort of sort through this idea and unpack what does this have to do with race and with us as modern people? How can we read this in a way that might enlarge our own understanding, you know, of our own situation as people in time and place bound by this, you know, or, or subject to, to, you know, the race and racism in the ways that they, they manifest um, for us. So I'm going to put, um, we will break out into small groups. I'll do breakout rooms here on Zoom, and Sari will help facilitate that in the parish hall. Uh, he's got some handouts with some questions. I'm also going to put the questions up here on the screen um, so we can read through those together before we go into conversation with one another. Um, and also some guidelines for conversation, because these conversations around subjects like this are sensitive, right? And so there's this little uh, rubric about how to navigate them sensitively, right? Taking responsibility for what we say by using I statements, using empathetic listening to hear and to understand, not to refute or rebut. Uh, sensitivity to communication differences. Some people are talkative, some people are less talkative. It's often not about more than that. Um, the invitation to ponder before speaking, listening first, responding later, examining our own assumptions, trying to suspend them in order to hear other points of view, keeping confidentiality by not sharing other people's stories that we don't have permission to share, and then also to trust amb ambiguity, that the goal is not to sort out right or wrong, but to reach some understanding. So here are the discussion questions I have for us today. Translate this story into our present context. What parallels do you see with the dynamics around race and racism in our own world today? Can you relate to Jesus' sense of delineation at the beginning of this exchange between his own sphere and that of this woman? What might we need to let go of 
in order to let ourselves be enlarged and our own barriers around race and privilege dissolved. And then finally, in Jesus, we're given a divine blueprint for becoming more fully human. And this story shows his own growth and evolution. How does Jesus' example here call us to an evolving discipleship in terms of race and racism? What might it look like to take that seriously in our own lives of faith? So I'm going to, I'll try to put the questions in the chat as well for those online. I'm going to break us out into breakout rooms. Um, we have about half an hour of discussion with one another, and then we uh, will have a few minutes to come back as a group to share. Let's see. I would say groups of about four or so, more or less, is probably ideal. Yeah, just do groups of four, as she suggested. I think that's good. So you guys four, one of you guys four. Awesome. Awesome. So if you're on Zoom and you're not in your room, you just need to click the invitation button. Yeah, I think it's probably 
So now I'm going to go to the college now. I'm going to be able to use it again. But I don't know if you know that. It's cool. 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 It's
Our friends, let me gather us back in. Are we convenient? All right. Here they come. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think we're still waiting on one. We wait for group three, room three to come back, and then we'll all be here. All right, uh, wonderful, welcome back everybody. Um, I would love to hear a little bit from um, each group if possible, but just, you know, what, what insights do you gathered or where you stumbled or what questions you have. Um, you can use the hand raise function if you're on Zoom or you can walk up to the mic if you're in the parish hall. I already see a hand from Becky, so we'll start with you, Becky. So I actually wanted to ask you this, Sarah, at the beginning of the conversation, but I was too afraid and the conversation within our group helped embolden me. So mm -hmm. what I'd like to know is how, what do you mean when we have this series about conversations about race? Because I just, um, given our previous conversations last spring, and the um, prospect of a statement from St. John's about race, my understanding was that we were targeting conversations about the black experience that the the racial issues for the black experience in America. But this story and even our conversation about it based on your um, reading of it to me, I, I I'm just not sure what you're asking us if we're looking at this through a more narrow lens. Um, of previous conversations, or if we're looking this just as a conversation about other, um, because this woman certainly fell into the category of other. So I, I would just like clar clarity about what do we mean when we're talking about race in these readings and these conversations? All right, that's a good question. Um, and it sort of dovetails into a couple other questions I got in a couple other rooms. Um, and I'll let Sari chime in too, if you'd like to, Sari. But so, right, we have this draft statement on race and equity that we are working on. And we also know that um, in order to adopt this statement, you know, that is sort of uh, an aspiration of how we'd like to bridge the gap between our ideals and our practices, right? Um, we need to, as a community, figure out how to have conversations about race, right? And so, um, you know, we envisioned these as not explicitly connected to that statement, these conversations, but as a chance to, as people of faith, you know, ask what the, what 
what the Bible might tell us, uh, or might have to say of, to us about race. Um, in terms of how narrowly or broadly we're defining that, the scope of that conversation on race, um, I, I, I used this analogy in another room. I feel like it's the relationship between a rectangle and a square, right? So all squares are rectangles, not all rectangles are squares, but they all, you know, the, 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 there are some characteristics that are the same, right? And we can talk about race and we can, you know, get comfortable talking about these sort of um, broader strokes. Um, and it's relevant to when you get into talking about the square as opposed to, to the rectangle, right? Like it's translatable in a way. Um, but I mean, Sari, you might have a different um, understanding of this, but my, I mean, my, uh, it, you know, my idea about this is just to like, give us the opportunity as people of faith to have these conversations about race, you know, from that perspective and, you know, to get more comfortable with that. That's it, Sarah, thank you. That's actually how I would respond to that. Thanks. So that, I really appreciate the clarification. I just wanna say that it's very, very different and much easier and safer to talk about other than it is to talk about racial tension in the United States. So and if part of the goal is to practice or getting comfortable with it, I'm not sure that, that, that these kinds of conversations, although really critical and touches on the same issues, are not fraught in the same ways that conversations about race are to the very specific nature of power structure and dynamics that are entrenched in our culture and society. So, um, but I, I really appreciate the, um, the clarification. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Becky. I think that's a really, that's a really important point. I thank you for making it. Who else would like to chime in, either from the parish hall or from Zoom? Somebody one from this group want to come up and just kind of do the highlights? Anybody from any group? You don't have to be the spokesperson for the group, but what, like, what, was, what felt significant? They're thinking about it, Sarah. I, okay. My people are thinking about it. You might, someone will come up. I think we should hear from everybody. So. Yeah, I'd love to hear from uh, from different groups, just sort of how, you know, what those conversations, you know, what the insights were gathered or or what questions were stumbled upon. Somebody in the parish hall. Hello, uh, my name is David Talbert. I'm actually, this is the first Sunday I'm attending at the 1030 service. Uh, my parents actually go here and we're new to the area. So okay. nice to meet most people. Welcome. Uh, so, so one thing we were talking about, which actually follows along from the last question, is, and I think it goes to why why it's so fraught to talk about race in our our country, is that sometimes we we shame people who don't have the right language in in how to talk about certain issues. So it's very easy that someone well-meaning trying to understand a dynamic about, let's say, race may use language that is offensive and mm -hmm. and so what you end up not being able to have is a genuine conversation but instead you end up being shamed about well you you're racist because of the way you're talking and and instead of and and so i think what i like about this story in the more generalized context is maybe we can talk about others and interaction with with people who have differences why, why we might have certain reactions and why we might not be able to communicate. So I think the first step in order to be able to bridge that otherness is to come to a common understanding that we're, we're human, we have common goals, we might not have a common language yet, but only through, you know, faith in the person you're talking to can, can you say, let's agree that we will find that common language in order to be able to talk. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's sort of, sort of an act of trust that goes into that, isn't there? Thank you, David. Sarah, I just want to point out something I, I didn't think about earlier until David started speaking. 
But I thought, I think it's really, it's notable the power difference between this lady and Jesus. Like Jesus was who he was. He also had the power to heal. And so she didn't have the permission to get really ticked off at his statement because she needed something from him, right? So there was that power difference. So she, in a very um, careful way, tries to like educate him. Right. But it's it's kind of an unfair they're not on equal level. They weren't standing on equal levels. And I, I just think about um, how race in this country uh, conversations, it's only recently that there has been an elevation. It feels like where people are able to say like that is racist, you know, and call it out. But for the longest time, you had to experience that racism and try to shift that perspective from the white man. You have to shift. You are a person of color. You had to shift it very carefully because there was a major power difference. There still is a power difference, unfortunately. But anyway, just that, I didn't think about that until David started speaking, so. Yeah, great, great catch. I love that. That's exactly right. Um, we've got Janet, go ahead. Oh, Janet, I'm sorry, you're muted. One of the things we talked about in our group was this, uh, this seemingly human trait to be, uh, to have the other. Um, it, it goes across cultures, I and mean, you can look across all cultures, and we can call it race. And a lot, of, a lot of cases, it's ethnicity. It could be all sorts of things, right? So, where does that come from? I mean, are we born like this? Are we taught it? We know, we know, we certainly are all taught it to an extent, right? But the fact that it goes across cultures suggests something else is at play. And so, then the question is, how do we get beyond that? I mean, how do we become Jesus who recognizes I need to go beyond it? So, we don't have an answer to that, but that is something we we talked about in our group. Uh, thank you. And thank God it's a project, right? But we've, we, we're invited to go beyond it. <laughs> um, one thing, uh, I'm Nancy Durr. I wanted to say in response to Sari's statement about uh, the power differential that this woman is experiencing and how careful she has to be, I think. She didn't know what she was going to experience uh, likely it wasn't going to be pleasant and what's motivating her is love for her daughter and so we our group sort of talked about this how she's saying her group dogs have even they scrape up crumbs from the table because they also need this just like children need the bread they also need it and that is has the power of sort of convincing Jesus. But the idea being that uh, how how all you know groups could be are vastly benefited. You know, it isn't it isn't like a fixed entity. Like there's only so much money, and we can only give it to certain people. But instead, the story is about how somebody is healed and so everybody is better you know because of it yeah yeah thank you so much well we are at 10 a.m if there's any parting shots we have uh room for maybe a time for maybe one more comment um and if not just thank you all for being here and for um, engaging in this these conversations um, with you know authenticity and vulnerability. They are vulnerable, um, and we've got we've got two more conversations coming up um, around different passages, different Bible stories over the next couple of weeks. Um, so I hope you will join us for that, either in person or on Zoom. Um, and until then, we'll we'll. See you at church. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>